Hi, I'm Sophie Milliken and welcome to this episode of the Ambition Accelerator podcast. Today I'm joined by Jacqueline de Rojas, CBE, President of Tech UK, Co-Chair of the Institute of Coding, Board Member at Rightmove, Costain Group, FDM Group and Mentor at American Co. Wow, what a lineup of roles Jacqueline has. I'm sure you're going to absolutely love this episode. to Jacqueline de Rocas. Um, thank you for joining me today to talk about all sorts of things to do with career development. So Jacqueline, you are the president of Tech UK and the co-chair of the Institute of Coding, as well as sitting on a number of boards. And I know you're involved in so many amazing things. So we'll get to hear about some of that, I'm sure. But can we start off with you telling us about you know what you wanted to do when you grew up did did you know as a child what you wanted to do do you know i always thought i would be a newscaster on the bbc that was my complete and utter absorbing ambition and when it came to it i actually went to study in germany because i wanted to i had quite a a uh, compromised family background. My my father was very violent, and mm. uh, my stepfather not much better. So, going abroad on a language and business uh, business degree seemed to be the easiest uh, way to remove myself from that situation. So, I was in Germany, and then of course the course ends. I was fluent in German, uh, had a grounding in in European business. And then I came back to London and my my idea about being a, a newscaster on the BBC didn't quite happen because I needed to pay the bills. So I was asked to join a company by a friend of mine, which was a company putting people into the technology industry. So it was recruitment. Mm. So it was it was it was interesting. I don't think I looked for a career in technology. I rather think it found me and I've been in technology all my life actually ever since so it's quite interesting but um, I don't know about career planning it's one of those things I do envy people who who say you know I want to be an astronaut and then actually do land on the moon <laughs> I did not I'm not one of those people I can't imagine there being many people um, that, that do that and I think there's an element of when you're younger you don't know what careers are out there and like you say certain things find you I mean I certainly didn't plan on doing any of the stuff that, that I've done um, so that's that's uh, that's really interesting and what is it about technology you said that you, you you know you love technology what was it that happened that made you fall in love with technology so <clears throat> technology wasn't a sector back then I mean let's face it the mobile phone hadn't been invented and we we did not have email. So the most sophisticated technical advice, um, a device that I had was a letter opener. You know, literally something that looked like a butter knife and I was opening CVs every morning and thinking, are they going to be good or not? And then finding time for you know, face-to-face -face interviews. So it was quite a slow paced industry, but then it started to pick up very quickly. And what I love about it and still love about it is the pace of change and the opportunity to deliver tech, which has a purpose and tech for good. And I'm so excited about how it has changed and transformed our lives, actually. Yeah, you can tell your face lights up when you talk about it, which I think is always a, a sign that, that you love something. So when you fell into technology and you start to progress in your career within that sector, did you have clear ambitions around sort of how far you wanted to progress your career in the sector? No, but the two things at play, my fear of failure is so high that I set myself goals about not failing rather than succeeding, which is, I don't know whether that's a female thing, but it's certainly a Jacqueline thing. And I desperately, even now, you know, I'm desperately not, not one that wants to fail. So I find myself striving for perfection to extraordinary levels and i set really high standards for myself that i would not set for anyone else and i imagine that that's quite a typical mindset for young women and young people actually in general but 
it's, it's really interesting that I, I didn't have goals and ambitions in the industry, but what I did know was that I could use all of my skills to become something better than before. And anything better than before was important to me because of my compromised mm. um, family upbringing. And I think it was just giving myself the options of not having to go back there. Mm-hmm. I suppose it's almost a survivor headset, mm-hmm. perhaps resilience, where I was so determined to carve out a safe future for myself yeah. that that was perhaps the overriding goal for me. And I needed some structure and I wanted to demonstrate to myself that I was making progress. So I wouldn't say I set goals other than I, kn- I knew what I didn't want. Mm-hmm. That's really interesting. So that's very much about your why and, and your reasons for, for, for making progress. I can really identify with that because when I set my business up, which was about six years ago now, I got divorced about six months in, which is not the best timing. And I had, my daughter was two at that point and I went from having, you know, I had a really good, well-paid job uh, in the corporate world before I set the business up. So I went from kind of having a great income to having a very small income to getting divorced to having this two-year-old. And it was really stressful. And one of the things that's driven me throughout this this time, so she, she's eight now, so six years ago, was that need to have some financial security. It was so, so important to me to then be able to make choices and to provide for my daughter and all these sorts of things. Um, so it, yeah, it's interesting how sometimes that can be the the driver your situation and improving your situation so that's um yeah i think i think that's true and i i I mean i'm on my third and final husband um so (laughs) it's quite interesting how i'm i'm very much looking to preserve this relationship and i believe we're in a good place after 20 years but i didn't make good choices and also um career came before relationship in those early days it was so important to me so i do think there is something around finding balance yeah. as well in striving for goals, especially when you are a self-confessed perfectionist like me, where you will crawl over broken glass to, to make it happen. So it's, it, it is an interesting dynamic and it's not one to brush past, I think. Mm. Having said that, when I did find myself in a stable position and um, looking at my career, I did one day sit down and think, I need to decide what I'm good at. And when I analyzed everything that I'd been through, the skill sets that I had, the behaviors that I have, the transferable skills that I have, I realized that the thing I was good at was problem solving. You throw anything at me and under pressure, I became the best version of myself. And So I branded myself as a troubleshooter. And this was really important because in the tech industry, and I run companies like McAfee, Citrix, um, Computer Associates, CA Technologies. And it's really interesting how when I branded myself as troubleshooter, the day I did that, I never looked back and I never looked for another job. They all came looking for me. So I think there is something quite important about being clear about personal brand And now, of course, we have wonderful platforms like LinkedIn and other um, social um, outlets where we can find a way to tell our personal story. But often people don't do that. They just describe a set of experiences versus what they bring to the party. And I think that's just a very important lesson that I learned quite early on to decide why people hire you and tell them that Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's really interesting I think um yes I can imagine a problem as a shooter would be a very useful person to have on any team and if you become known for that I can understand why why people would would seek you out it was really interesting what you were saying a bit earlier on there around um prioritizing career over relationships and this might this might be too personal a question so tell me to stop if if it is but you you said there that perhaps you prioritizing your career in those earlier relationships in 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 your first marriages um you know did 
would you say that that contributed to, to them not working out? Or do you think it was that actually they weren't the right people and, and that would have happened regardless and you've got a different dynamic with your current husband or you've changed how you prioritise relationships? There are so many, so many variables. I think, firstly, I chose, I chose characteristics in my earlier relationships that I was familiar with and which were probably not positive ones. So I think that's quite common too. Um, I certainly spent more time at work probably because it felt like a safer structure a bit like when I chose school over home when I was younger it was a safe place to be so I think I had that and I mean there was youth and all of those things and unfortunately this is another interesting thing in the, in the tech industry the tech industry pays rather well and certainly did for me in those in those early days because you know we were going from you know i joined a team of six people and suddenly we were 300 people three months later so it was that kind of escalation and you know leadership skills in those days were very highly thought of and still are and so my salary kept um increasing uh and 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 at pace and that wasn't the case um in my earlier relationship so that's also quite a difficult balance yeah. to to um, to reconcile and also my daughter uh, Stephanie so I was responsible for her I feel the same responsibility as you do for your daughter and I it's very interesting that I worked incredibly hard to be the best mum possible not guilt-free because I was working a lot you couldn't you had to go to work to be at work so it was a question of putting her with someone else and walking out of the door so all of that made life very difficult but then I did come to an epiphany and it's easier when you're older to think this but that I probably remember every single sports day play you know teachers evening that, that I missed but I don't remember why other than it was work. And so I would say that there is a real opportunity now post lockdown to reevaluate what balance in home and work life really means because we are sort of tacitly being given permission to operate virtually. Now that's not always good for everybody and I do recognize that. But on the whole, it means that flexible working is now much more acceptable and we can choose the hours that we, that we work. And that wasn't always the case. And I would just say to make sure that you choose a uh, lifestyle first and have your career fit into it after mm -hmm. versus the other way around. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's really good advice um for sure and i think that you're absolutely right in terms of coming out of lockdown the fact that most organized or many organizations have proven that it does work and you know anyone that hasn't done much homeworking has had to kind of make it work so um, i'm hopeful that that will provide a lot more flexibility in the future which i think can only be a really positive thing um so that's that's great Really positive. So thinking back um, throughout your career and even now, have you had any role models that have helped you or inspired you in any way? Certainly. I mean, so many. And Simone Roche is definitely one of those who she just never stops campaigning. I know. She's an advocate. She's passionate. She draws us all in. I love the fact that it's hashtag not just London, you know, and, and there are so many things that Simone represents. And, you know, I think the sisterhood in the tech industry is extremely strong. We can connect and reach into each other in a very respectful way, in a way where I know if I have something that I can't solve or something on my mind, I could reach into tens of you know maybe 50 maybe hundreds of women where i could ask the question and actually not just women you know our man ambassadors as well who support uh, equality and inclusion are all there to to support and i do think that's what sets this country apart actually from any other technology industry is that our network is really strong and we we do care about each other 
So I think that's really important. And, and all of those people for me would be role models, all of them. Um, specifically though, in my life, my mother, who was you know, the victim of domestic violence actually, and she, she has been through so much in her life and now suffers sadly from dementia, which sometimes I wonder whether that's a way of protecting herself from all of those, those memories, I don't know. Um, but the divine thing is that she, she never liked chocolate actually, but now she, she's forgotten that, so she quite likes it, which <laughs> it's a joy. <laughs> I know. So she's, um, she's a big role model. And of course, my daughter is an incredibly um, strong, determined, confident actor. Uh, and um, she's very resourceful. She is a brilliant reverse mentor who does not hesitate to poke me in the eye and challenge me when I'm you know, wavering from the path. And, you know, I love that. I think reverse mentoring is with young people is so enlightening because we can be very entrenched and stuck in our ways. And diversity does mean looking outwards, not inwards. And it does mean including all voices, regardless of age yeah. uh, and capability and geography. And I think those voices really make a difference to me and I, I love to include them so I've got lots of role models around me including I don't know we can go to Audrey Hepburn as well where I love her effortless elegance but she wasn't just a beautiful woman she was also an advocate and campaigner for the UN mm -hmm. but we all see pictures of her looking lovely and that's probably a you know a mi minuscule amount of what she was about she she did so much for for young children and women uh, who are underprivileged, and also then of course uh, big thought leaders like the Dalai Lama, I, I just really worship at the altar of people who have time to think and time to share um, thoughts that are not just in the weeds but are big blue sky thinking. It, it lifts me. Mm. Wow, so quite a wide range there. I think it's really interesting you touched there on sort of mentoring and, and reverse mentoring within within role models there. And you also touched on something else, which is one of the topics that, that I've listed around asking for help and knowing where to go for help and advice. Now, you know, when I was starting out on in my career sort of 20, 20 years ago, there was a lot of feeling um, that I was explicitly told, and I also felt it in the workplace around women perhaps not helping each other. Have you experienced that or, or have you seen a shift? I mean, I've certainly seen a shift and, and I would say it's completely different right now. And I think people are more supportive, which is great and more visibly supportive of each other. What's been your experiences? Well, there is a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, as brilliantly articulated by Madeleine Albright and Maya Angelou, I believe those two. And so, yes, I have. It's very rare for women not to support other women these days in tech. We have such a strong momentum, which is anti that. So I think, I think it's rare. Are there microaggressions? Absolutely, but that's not just about women, that's about, you know, um, ethnicity and neurodiversity uh, and, and introverts and, and all sorts of things. So I think there are microaggressions which we have to be concerned about. Um, you know, it might be a little question about, well, if you're talking about promotion, well, what, how are you going to handle childcare? Or what about Sally, if that's your daughter's name? You know, it could be, and that's a microaggression in some way. So, you know, I do think um, there are things that happen in the workplace and they can't be ignored. Have I ever experienced it? Yes. Uh, and my strategy is just to remove myself from the situation. I will not work in a culture that I'm uncomfortable with. And I work in multiple different uh, board situations. So I'm very clear when I choose where I'm going to spend my time that the culture is something that will embrace me and that I can be inspired by versus a culture which does not serve me so 
if anybody is choosing a new career anywhere, I would check out the culture first, because regardless of anything else, culture trumps strategy all the time. And I think that you will thrive in a culture that is aligned with your values, highly likely. Yeah, I think that's that's great advice and definitely something that when people are setting out on their careers, they should carry out research into culture and not just base that research on the company's website and try and look a bit deeper, maybe talk to employees that have worked for that company or worked for that company and do a bit more digging, I think, to see whether they uh, live their values and, and beliefs as well as sort of just talking about them. I think that's right, Sophie. And, and also there is humour too, which, you know, I'm not saying don't call it out when the microaggressions happen, by the way. I do remove myself from the situation, but I'm not um, turning around and walking out without saying anything necessarily. So let me give you an example of, uh, in 99, um, I, I was, um, well, let me tell you a different story, actually, rather than that one. I took some customers to the um, Grand Prix at Silverstone. Ooh. And we decided to take them uh, in a helicopter to avoid the traffic because the traffic is terrible at the Grand Prix. <laughs> and one of my, so it was, it was designed to charm the customers. Of course it was. And one of my team said, would you, to, to a customer, would you like to meet the managing director? And the customer turned um, and said, yes, I'd love to meet him. Of course, he turned around and saw me and he said, oh my God, I didn't realize you were a woman. And I said, oh, my God, I didn't realize I needed a penis to make a decision. Yeah. But hey, let's discuss it over lunch. And I have a big smile on my face. And, you know, I, I injected humor into that. And the reason I did that was because, firstly, I wasn't going to let that go. So I called it out. Secondly, though, I knew I had to sell to this client. So we had to have a relationship that worked. So I, I wanted to call it out, but not crush him. Yeah. So leaving dead bodies around me is not my style. So I tend to deal with it. But with humor, I think you have an opportunity to then create a one plus one equals 11. And so we had lunch, a marvelous lunch. And he had been then a customer, I think, for 20 years after that. And he's probably spent more money than he should have because probably is feeling horribly guilty and I'm fine with that but it, you know it's quite interesting I think there is something around the rise of feminism which I I choose not to rage against the machine mm. I choose to leverage um, the energy around me to my advantage and I use humor to do that which it it serves me better it it works with my leadership style better mm. which tends to be non-confrontational but clear Mm. And I think that's it, isn't it? It's it's identifying your style and behaving in a way that that you feel comfortable with. And I was going to ask you how, how that guy responded, but it sounds like obviously that that worked out well. And actually, I bet he never did that again as well. Yeah, it's a life lesson. And but I think call you can you know if you said to someone, you must take the opportunity to call it out. There are probably thirty different ways you could do it. And as you say, I think. If you're really going to own it, it has to be your authentic self that would respond. Now, if you asked someone else, it might be that raging against the machine would be the thing, but then the relationship might not have delivered what you needed it to deliver. So there are always consequences to actions and we have to think about that. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you've touched on this, I think, in a roundabout way already, because you talked earlier about having a fear of failure and that driving you on. And um, I listened to you on Desert Island Discs talking about imposter syndrome. So, oh, yeah. um, and, and that's a very real syndrome that is often associated with women. And... I'd just like to hear you talk a bit about that and, and if and how that affects you now, because, you know, if anyone was to, to Google you, they'll find that you've won all sorts of awards and you've got accolades for this, that and the other, and you've got some fantastic experience and all these wonderful things. And people would probably think, how on earth would she have imposter syndrome? And um, 
you know, does it go away? Have you learned, how do you learn to deal with it? How do you manage that? How, how do you tame it? Yeah, gosh, I don't know. I think I have felt inadequate all my life and I have a terrorist in my head that I try and turn the volume down on and sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. Actually, meditation mm. is super useful for getting the balance right in my head. I, I am very, very blessed that my third and final husband is a meditation and yoga teacher. Yeah. So we meditate together every morning, not for a long period of time, but um, short period of time. And it just creates that that cigarette paper worth of choice in my day where under pressure I just feel there's a little bit of light and maybe some different options that I could take but on imposter syndrome so I, I found myself in uh, employed as managing director of a business on my first day and I, somehow I managed to get this job I have no idea why they employed me even now but they obviously saw lots of leadership qualities in me that I I couldn't possibly see. And I was sat at a big desk, you know, with oak lined office and, and a bar in the corner and a boardroom table and, and uh, an, uh, an assistant outside. I'd never had one of those, so I didn't know what to do with that. And I thought, oh my God, if anyone asked me anything about this business, I have no idea what to say. So I decided to shift my leadership self from one of knowing things to one of not knowing things. So in other words, I led with curiosity and with questions. And so if anyone came into my office, I would say, what's the agenda and what, what outcome are you driving for? And do you know, Sophie, I can't tell you how many people can't answer that question even today. <laughs> uh, and in fact, I think there's a Swedish study that says 70% of the time meetings are for showing off. And it's, it's, I, I must find that, that study um, output actually, because that would be really interesting to quote. And it's so interesting how people then decided, my reputation was, don't go into her office because she digs for details six feet deep. Because all I was doing was asking questions. But it is the difference between, between being interested and interesting. And if you're interesting, you will run out of stuff really fast. Knowing things, you know, uh, rather than asking questions, you just, you just don't have much in the tank. But it, but it's a bit like children. They never stop asking questions. And I think great leaders never stop being brilliantly curious. And it was such a transformation in my leadership style. And also, actually, it gave other people space to be amazing rather than all the decisions coming to me, rather than all the great ideas coming from me. And it was just an overnight shift in how... I think I went from manager to leader because of that. That's really interesting. Someone once told me um, when I was a fairly fresh graduate that actually as a leader, you didn't have to know a huge amount about the subject. It was more about getting the most from the team and from the people that, that you lead. Uh, and I've reflected on that quite a bit over the years. And I, I do think there's, there's a quite a lot of truth in that because if you know in any role you're going to be working with people pretty much so if you if you're getting those results from the wider team then everything kind of works well I guess from that. well it am, it amplifies and it scales possibility because if you are the, the con, you know command and control kind of leader where you are the only one that has the ideas and makes all the decisions then you and the 150 people that work for you are subject to your single idea if you set the other 150 people free, you have 150 ideas. And so scale and reach suddenly becomes much more likely and much more possible. And that's how I became a troubleshooter because I didn't rely on myself, I relied on all of them. And I had many more ideas about how we were going to shorten the route to success and it was brilliant. But going back to imposter syndrome, I, for example, interview quite a lot of people as part of London Tech Week and last week I interviewed Tony Blair and I don't know about you but for a man who whether you whether you love or hate his politics is irrelevant actually what you're confronted with is someone who's incredibly learned he's an ex-barrister he's won three consecutive elections as a Labour leader which is unheard of in this country and he's incredibly articulate 
And so I, I mean, do you, do you think that I had imposter syndrome? You should, I mean, I have a photograph of, I have myself in front of my screen, Zoom screen. I had papers everywhere with all of the questions and sub questions, questions in case I ran out of questions. And it was so interesting and all trying to be in the eye line of the camera. So I wasn't doing this as I was looking around. So was I over prepared? For sure. Did I have imposter syndrome? Completely. And I, I feel it in, I literally feel it in my fingers. I can feel energy coursing through my fingers. And so, yes, do, do I still feel it today? I do. And um, do I then, though, take steps to control it by being incredibly prepared? Yes, I do. And that's okay. And I think the thing about resilience and, and imposter syndrome is that, you know, resilience is one side of the coin. The other side of that coin that, that you mentioned and is super important is to be able to ask for help because resilience um, is something that makes you very independent. You're a survivor. You're in a, you're best when you're in a corner. But if you don't ask for help, then again, you are locked into that single headset you know nobody you're not looking at diverse voices coming in you're making a binary decision versus amplifying your choices and i i think that's a very important part of resilience i, I agree with that and i think that you know young people coming into the jobs market are perhaps nervous about asking questions because they don't want to be a nuisance but actually i think when you're new to something that's the best time to ask questions because it's acceptable and, and people will expect that and, and then as you progress through your career you just get the confidence to to know that it's totally fine to ask questions and actually it, it will help you so i think um you know that's that's a really useful um you know way of way of dealing with things and going back to your point about resilience the Institute of Student Employers, which is the body that, that I work with a lot, they did some research with employers at the end of last year about what skills graduates were lacking and also school leavers. And they said that um, their employers were telling them that resilience is the skill that young people are most lacking. And I've been thinking about that a lot recently and actually thinking about how, given the current lockdown situation, that everyone's resilience is being tested to the max and actually there are probably now some wonderful examples that people will be able to draw upon where they've shown resilience and, and be able to come up with some practical ways that, that they've handled that so it's great to hear you say it's fine to ask questions and that that's good because I think thinking back to when I started out on work I probably was nervous about asking too many questions for fear of being mm. a, bit of a, a pest but it's maybe going back again to when we were very young children where that's all we did and, and and getting some of that back to to progress i think so and i i think as i've become um older i i certainly believe that vulnerability is my fortress mm. you know that when i have shown that i don't know something to my team or you know i've been curious about something or nervous about something Sometimes I leave with that, and you know, even when I was talking to to, um, to to important guests offline, I would say, "You know, I'm a bit nervous about this," and it's, it's actually okay to do that. And I don't think it diminishes your uh, yourself. I think it it actually makes you stronger. Yeah, well, I always think a bit of nerves is healthy because I think it shows that you care. You know, I get incredibly nervous when I'm speaking. To uh, I did my yeah. next talk just before lockdown, and I can't describe to you how sick I felt in in the lead up, in in the month <clears throat> leading up to that. The day itself, I literally thought I was going to be sick before I went onto that stage. But it was because I wanted to do a good job and get my message across and. I think that's natural and it does give you that adrenaline rush that sometimes you need in those situations. And yeah. then when you're reflecting on whatever the situation was, like I bet for your Tony Blair interview, for example, I bet you felt amazing after that call and really pumped up because it had gone well because of all the preparation that you'd done. I did. I, absolutely. I mean, I was also a little bit exhausted, but um, what someone, I, I do um, professionally mentor sea level uh, leaders in UK PLC businesses through a company called Merrick and one of my own um, in we have peer group supervision so we can bring our stuff to the table and talk about what we're worried about 
and I said, oh, I've got this interview coming up and I'm really nervous. I'm going to screw it up. And, and actually one of my, my peers said to me, you know what, Jacqueline, though, everyone's looking for a good outcome in that situation. So everyone wants you to succeed. They don't want you not to deliver a good interview. So he's not going to make it hard for you. Yeah. And actually just grounding yourself and reminding yourself and just putting out there that you're a bit nervous you do get some great feedback from your peers that you know it's going to be all right and it really helped actually yeah i can imagine no, it sounds like sounds like that went really well that's brilliant okay just um i've just got two more questions i think before mm. we wrap up so again this is something that that has cropped up throughout our conversation and it's this idea around prioritizing different things and the use of work-life balance now in in the book i talk about there being different parts to your work or, or your and and your life and my view is that you can't there is no balance because it's very easy for something to go off balance and i think that you can prioritize the things that are important to you at certain points in time but you can't prioritize everything What's been your experience of, of work-life balance? Have you, have you got it? Does it exist? Can you have it all? Well, I think it depends how you define it. I, 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 only, I don't really, um, I look at my life in terms of success or learning. So when I've screwed up, I tend to reframe it as something I've learned from. So um, I, in my early days, when I had a little person running around, I chose to delegate the childcare. Mm -hmm. She had, you know, a nanny and then a childminder uh, and then boarding school, actually. Um, her choice, the boarding school piece, because it was a musical theatre school and a piano in every room and, and, you know, just a joy. But um, for her, she will say, mum worked a lot and I understand why. So do I look back at that and think, I wish I hadn't. I do in some ways, but you know, again, I was I was running uh, so fast in a tech business. I was on my own. I wanted her to have all the things that she wanted. So, I think you do have to prioritize um, creating the conditions for you to thrive, mm -hmm. whatever that means. But also recognize that there are going to be compromises. What I chose to do though was to put a really great team around me who could help me and that's that's the difference between um, my experience and maybe my male counterparts experience at the time was that if someone offered me a job I had to reflect what my army of helpers were going to be able to do to support me in either a location change a uh, time at work change a um, traveling overseas change um, and for most male colleagues at that time, they didn't have to make those uh, considerations. And so I think it was very different. I think I did prioritize work over Stephanie at the time. And I think I needed to do that in order to create the conditions for us to thrive as a family. And we talk about that now. Would I, would I do anything different? I don't think I could have actually. Oh, but I'm, rec I'm reconciled to the compromise. Yeah, and, and it's, you know, you've spoken about her a lot during our conversation, so it comes across that you've got a very strong relationship. What's been her, I mean, does she, does she have children? Not yet. Not yet, not yet. I'm just wondering how, how she'll take your relationship and, and what, what she will, you know, how she'll prioritise things. But what's been her feedback? You know, she said to you, you know, mum worked a lot. Um, does she see that? Is a positive thing you know does, does she feel like she missed out on anything or I'm sure she does feel that she missed out on things she certainly will say that she has learned resilience because she had to learn to be independent pretty young so absolutely she certainly has learned um, confidence because she's had to hold her ground without me being there she learned how to operate in a team, so collaboration. I think she learned very young as well because she needed to create her own family. 
And so lots and lots of things that um, she will probably feed back if I asked her that now. I do think it has made us closer because we've been able to talk about those things and we've been through quite a lot together. We holiday on our own together oh, every year yeah. anyway and she's locked down with me oh. so <laughs> but she has she she continues to to have um animals so she's got this little dog who she prioritizes above anything so I imagine that she's going to be um quite similar in terms of loving her own I think one of the things she has taken away which is very strong for me is her work ethic so I see her working harder than I've ever seen a human strive for perfection I think that's probably both a blessing and a curse because I have given her that and I think she, yeah she 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 will strive for perfection she'll crawl over broken glass to reach a goal and sometimes I wish she didn't work that hard but it makes her brilliant at what she does she almost needs that pressure mm. and creates that pressure in order to create perfection mm. she sounds great and I think you know you working hard and progressing with your career has taught us all sorts of skills but actually it's also provided opportunities because presumably had you not um, prioritised and focused on your career you would probably wouldn't have been able to afford to send her to the boarding school as an example. Yeah no exactly right and and what I do notice about about her though is that she does all of the things um, the perfection thing the hard work ethic but she does it to even greater heights than than I ever would and I, I admire that in her she plays Carmen in Fame, the musical, and she's just yeah. such a strong character, dying on stage every night. It's just, it's so, so heart-wrenching. As a parent, I'm sure it's payback in some way, actually. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Oh, that's great. Okay, so um, one, um, to, to, to wrap up, what would be, if you could choose one key piece of advice that you've received or, or that you you want to pass on yourself that served you well what what would that be specifically to, to young people starting out on their careers what one piece of advice would you pass on young people or young women well let's you know this is focused on women so let's make it specific to women so one piece of advice that I wish I had known earlier in my career is that you don't have to have you don't have to be a man to make it and this is not anti men actually but it's about being your authentic self in order to fit in to the culture that i was operating in which was very male dominated very sales orientated very tough very pressured i took on the male characteristics of you know, language, discipline. Um, there was an edge that I that I had, and and have since substituted for soft power. And I even I think wore a tie to work at times. So such was my desire to fit in, and I realised when I cross the chasm from manager to leader, actually that the soft power is so important and that tolerance and kindness and compassion are perhaps stronger opportunities for us to thrive and enable other people to thrive in our teams than um, being an alpha zilla, which I definitely was. And I am sure there are people out there who wish they hadn't worked for me. But and I apologise to all of those people. <laughs> oh, brilliant! Oh, that's really good advice. And I think you know it is very much about being being yourself, and you know because you'll do your best work if you're being true to yourself as well. You're not wasting energy on on pretending to be something that you're not, and you're going to get you know have better relationships with people as a result of that. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Great. Okay, well, thank you so much for talking to me. That's yeah, sure. Thank you, Sophie. I've really enjoyed hearing some of your stories and what you're
flew and uh, interviewed Tony Blair. That's so cool. I know, so great. He was yeah, great. I'm in Newcastle. People love Tony Blair in Newcastle. There's got a lot of fans up here. But uh, and his wife, I'd love to meet his wife. I mean, she's amazing. She would be. Very she cool. is. She is amazing. And I did. I swapped a couple of emails with her last week. She's. She's got a great, um, great campaign to help female founders actually uh, to thrive. And so there's a, there's a campaign about to kick off around that. So I love her. She's great. She's really great. I hope that you enjoyed listening to this episode of the Ambition Accelerator as much as I enjoyed recording it. If this was your first experience of tuning in, go back and listen to previous episodes as there are some brilliant ones. Please do go and check those out. Hope to catch you next time.